Welcome to Keep the Faith Ministry. Keep the Faith brings you timely messages with in-depth spiritual analysis of current events in light of Bible prophecy so you can prepare for the coming of Jesus. Listen to what the news won't tell you. Here is another important message for our times. This is Pastor Hal Mayer. Welcome to Keep the Faith Ministry. Thank you for joining me again this month. Your prayers and encouraging support for Keep the Faith make a big difference to what we can do for the Lord. I pray that God's Spirit will rest on you and your family as we study together this month. I also hope that you are making time for Jesus every day. You need it now more than ever as the dark night of sin continues to strengthen. We live in a world of endless tragedy. Everywhere you turn, people are stressed out of their minds. Millions grope in darkness, searching for something that gives them meaning and purpose. They live with a gaping hole in their hearts because they don't know the true love of God. They try anything and everything to find peace or distraction from fear, anxiety, and the emptiness that they have. If ever there was a time when people need the Lord, it is now. You and I are no exception, especially as this world comes nearer and nearer to the close of probation. We need Jesus to navigate the great and challenging times in which we live, let alone that which is coming in the near future. Highwood Health Retreat is still providing wonderful opportunities to reach out to souls. I just want to tell you about a miracle. We've been praying that God would open the door for Keep the Faith Ministries Oceana, to bring religious workers from overseas to help with direct soul-winning work at Highwood. We have many guests who need to have someone work with them and teach them about the love of God. We submitted our application to the government and prayed that God would open the doors. Just recently, the Australian government sent me a letter granting our request. That is a major hurdle, and we're thrilled. We're praying that we can soon start an active Bible work program and see more souls won to the truth. We are hoping also that this December and January we will be able to remodel Highwood's therapy department and a few other areas of the health retreat. If you received a letter included in this mailing, please read the thrilling story of Wendy. It will warm your heart, and I hope you will consider what you can do to help our project. If you would like to talk about the project, or if you would like to volunteer to help, please contact our office. Don't forget to renew your subscription to Keep the Faith Ministry's free monthly sermons. You won't want to miss a thing in the coming months. It is vital that you turn in your yellow card unless you have signed up since January of this year. You can also renew by contacting us through our website. And thank you for your gifts and prayers for Keep the Faith Ministry. They are very important to us. Lastly, be sure that your friends know about Keep the Faith Ministry. Give them a pink sign-up card and urge them to become subscribers. Also, share your CDs. If you would like us to send you a bulk quantity to share with others each month, let us know. We can do that for you. We want to reach as many people as possible with those little CD preachers. Now let us pray. Our Heavenly Father... We live in a violent and dangerous world. It seems that evil is everywhere, and we cannot escape it. A dark night is rising upon this world, and it is painful to us, especially when we think of the beauty and light of heaven. Our dark night is getting even darker as the wickedness and violence increases. The sheer peace and tranquility of heaven inspires us, and we long to be there. Because of that, we ask you today to draw us very close to Jesus through your Holy Spirit. We need to be under his protection, under the shadow of the Almighty. We know that with Jesus there is nothing to fear, because the perfect love of Jesus casts out all fear. But today, Lord, we are going to study a sobering, gut-wrenching topic. We pray that through it we will sense that this dark night will soon be over, and that your coming will be soon. Please send your Holy Spirit to us today as we study this most relevant and prophetically significant subject. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible reveals that there is coming a new world, 
a new society of peace and harmony. This is wonderful news, and it all revolves around the soon return of Jesus. But the Bible also tells us that just before Jesus comes again, the world we live in will be very similar to the way it was in the days of Noah. Genesis 6, 11, and 13 tells us the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now here is a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 101. The picture which inspiration has given of the antediluvian world represents too truly the condition to which modern society is fast hastening. Even now in the present century, and in professedly Christian lands, there are crimes daily perpetrated as black and terrible as those for which the old world sinners were destroyed. That statement gives us a very good picture of the state of things today in our world, doesn't it? The time had come for 24-year-old James E. Holmes. It was July 20, 2012 the opening night screening of the latest episode in the violent Batman thriller series called The Dark Knight Rises. He had been planning and calculating this night for many months. Four months prior, Holmes told a classmate that he wanted to kill people. Over the next four months, he purchased his new wardrobe of body armor, mostly on the Internet, four weapons from gun stores, and more than 6,000 rounds of ammunition from online stores. Holmes parked his car in the back of the Century 16 Multiplex Theater in Aurora, Colorado, near an exit door to Theater 9. He bought a ticket and sat down in the front row of the theater near the emergency exit. Twenty minutes after the film started, he went outside through the exit, propped the door open, and went to his car. He quickly changed into protective gear, including a gas mask, a tactical load-bearing assault vest, which is designed for carrying weapons, ammunition, and other combat equipment, a ballistic helmet, bullet-resistant leggings, throat and groin protectors, and tactical gloves. He was largely bulletproof, protected from head to toe. Holmes was also heavily armed. His weapons were a 12-gauge Remington tactical shotgun, a Smith & Wesson semi-automatic rifle, which had been upgraded with a 100-round high-powered drum magazine that would allow him to fire 50 to 60 rounds of bullets a minute without having to reload, and two Glock handguns. He also had a couple of tear gas canisters. In Colorado, these weapons are as common as the average middle-aged male. Most people use these kinds of weapons for completely legal purposes, such as hunting, target practice, or even self-defense and personal protection. Holmes had purchased these weapons legally like tens of thousands of others. Holmes also legally bought an arsenal of ammunition, including 3,000 rounds of handgun bullets, 3,000 rounds for an assault rifle, and 350 rounds for a 12-gauge shotgun. It's easy for gun enthusiasts to blow through 400 to 500 rounds of ammo at target practice on a single vigorous day at the firing range. So having 6,000 rounds of ammunition around is not uncommon. In fact, many gun owners would consider 6,000 rounds of ammunition to be rather low. It would be time to order more. But Holmes had not purchased these for legal purposes. He had no police record of any felony, which would have prevented him from buying the weapons and ammunition so he easily passed the required background checks. The UPS Courier Company delivered 90 packages to his home, and authorities say he spent roughly $15,000 online to fortify his arsenal within the previous two months. Holmes also bought a large amount of supplies to make explosives and to elaborately rig his entire apartment flat with a complex series of booby-trapped explosive devices and tripwires that took bomb squad experts days to dismantle. He had rigged jars filled with accelerants like gasoline to spread a fire quickly, chemicals that would explode if mixed together, and more than 30 improvised grenades. His apartment flat was designed to kill the first person that entered. 
most likely a police officer, and perhaps more, in the explosion and ensuing fire. Holmes' weapon skills were quite well developed, though he had no military or police training. In fact, they were better than most police officers. He had apparently practiced handling his weapons to the point where he could easily transition from one to the other without difficulty. Considering the weapons he had on that fateful night, he would have had to practice the changeover moves repeatedly in advance in order to quickly deliver his deadly barrage on the unsuspecting crowded theater. Holmes had also practiced shooting his weapons somewhere, though as of the time of preparing this sermon, authorities had not discovered where. When a target is standing in front of you, like at a police firing range, officers can hit 90-plus percent of their targets. But on the street, that ratio drops to between 20 and 25 percent. Holmes' hit ratio on the fateful night was twice that, more than 50 percent. That represents considerable skill, according to experts, especially when accounting for the darkness and confusion in the theater and his protective gear. Holmes was no novice. Experts say that he could not have gained those skills without considerable practice and advanced planning. When Holmes returned to Theater 9 at 12.38 a.m. on Friday morning, dressed in black and looking like a member of a SWAT team, the audience didn't perceive him as a threat. It was as if he was wearing a costume, just like many of the rest of them. After all, this was a Batman movie. Some believed that he was playing a prank. Others thought he was part of a special effects publicity stunt set up for the film's premiere by the studio or theater management. But Holmes was no stunt act, nor was he a prankster. He knew he would only have a few minutes to wreak havoc on the packed theater audience and kill as many as possible. Holmes had dyed his hair orange, apparently like the Joker, Batman's arch-villain in the film, though it could not be seen due to his ballistic helmet. Holmes walked in through the emergency exit he had propped open near the stage. "'I am the Joker!' he allegedly shouted. He threw canisters of tear gas into the crowd, which caused their eyes and throats to burn and obscured their vision. Then he savagely opened fire with a 12-gauge Remington and began rapidly shooting live bullets into the disbelieving crowd. Chaos and panic erupted as tear gas made it difficult for the theatergoers to see what was happening or where to flee. When the Remington was out of bullets, Holmes dropped the gun and transitioned to his high-powered semi-automatic rifle. After about 30 rounds, the drum magazine jammed, and he threw it aside, smoothly pulled out one of the glocks, and started shooting with that. Had the rifle not jammed, perhaps there would be a lot more dead. When Holmes expended his ammunition, he calmly turned and walked back out the exit door to his car. When the melee was over, 12 people were dead or mortally wounded. He had also wounded 58 other victims, including some in the adjoining theater number 8, which was showing the same film. Some of the bullets went through the wall and into the other crowded theater. This was the highest number of casualties ever in an American mass shooting. By the time Holmes walked back out to the parking lot, the police were already at the scene. They first thought Holmes was part of a SWAT team because his protective gear was so complete but at least one or two of them noticed that his gas mask was not a regulation mask. They quickly realized that they had the shooter and immediately arrested him. But the rampage in the theater was not the only damage Holmes had planned. He had also booby-trapped his home with an elaborate series of explosive devices. To achieve that level of sophistication, Holmes would have had to have some pretty good instructions and training, and a good deal of practice. Around midnight, while Holmes was at the theater, loud music started blaring from his apartment flat, probably started by a timer. One woman came there and banged on the door to get him to turn off the music. Finding the door unlocked, she almost opened it and came in, but decided against it, no doubt narrowly averting a deadly explosion. When police learned of the explosives after arresting Holmes, they evacuated five buildings surrounding his residence, climbed through a window, and began the work of diffusing the explosive devices, while local hospitals tried to cope with the overload of wounded victims. 
As news of the horror began to emerge, the question on most people's minds was, why? What would cause someone to do such a dark and evil deed? An employee at the jail where Holmes was arraigned told a reporter, he thinks he's acting in a movie. Real life had become a drama. His rampage was theatrical in every sense. Many people want to argue that there's no link between violence seen in a movie and actual violence on the street. For instance, only a few hours after the shooting, IndieWire proclaimed, Don't blame the movie, as if an army of cultural warriors was poised over the hill ready to charge Warner Brothers. But Holmes' actions, ironically, were modeled after what he had seen in the previous Batman movies. There's no escaping it. What we see with our eyes has a profound effect on us. It changes the inner workings of our minds. Holmes was a brilliant young man, brimming with potential. He was a graduate student in the specialized area of neuroscience. And while an undergraduate, he had mapped the neurons of zebra finches and studied the flight muscles of hummingbirds. He was on the road to success in the scientific field. Holmes had also been a summer camp counselor for underprivileged kids. He was very nice, polite, and always had a ready smile. He kept to himself, excelled academically, and kept himself out of trouble. No one would have imagined that he would ever do such a thing. But Holmes was fascinated with the imaginary. He apparently lived in a fantasy world. His choice of the Batman film to stage a theatrical mass murder is in line with the principles portrayed in other Batman films. He had no doubt planned and choreographed his actions in advance, just as would be done by actors in the films. Friends, you cannot expect that by repeatedly seeing evil impressions with your eye that you will not be affected by it. You cannot expect that by repeatedly hearing evil things that you will not be gradually changed into an evil person. We copy what we see. If not consciously, it happens subconsciously. It is a law of the human mind that it eventually mimics what it has seen or heard. Others around us can often see the changes and even describe them, while the person doesn't even recognize that he has changed. The Aurora, Colorado mass murder has not been the only example of violence in modern times. A couple of weeks later, on August 5, Wade Michael Page walked into a Sikh temple in Wisconsin and began shooting without saying a word. By the time the assault was over, he had killed six people, five men and one woman, and wounded four others before he turned his weapon on himself. Page had been an army vet who was dishonorably discharged for misbehavior. He joined the white supremacist and neo-Nazi movement and played in a number of white power music bands, one of them called Definite Hate. He spoke of an impending racial holy war. His motives are unclear, but it was obvious that he had serious proclivities to violence and a racial philosophy to go with it. The gruesome theater massacre and the deranged killing in Wisconsin illustrate the prophetic times in which we live. We cannot escape it. Violence, my friends, is a permanent feature of human society. We even get used to it and quickly brush it off if it isn't happening to us or to someone near us. And it comes right down to us from the fall. Here's another part of that prophetic statement I read from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 101. The issues of the press teem with records of murder, crimes so cold-blooded and causeless that it seems as though every instinct of humanity were blotted out. And these atrocities have become of so common occurrence that they hardly elicit a comment or awaken surprise. The spirit of anarchy is permeating all nations, and the outbreaks that from time to time excite the horror of the world are but indications of the pent-up fires of passion and lawlessness that, having once escaped control, will fill the earth with woe and desolation. So let's put this together. The violence we see in the theaters or DVDs from Hollywood we soon see in real life. And the violence we see in real life is only a small indication of what is coming upon the world when the restraining hand that controls the pent-up passions of man will be let loose. 
We are in for some shocking things, my friends. We live in a terrible world, and God has now given us a glimpse of what is coming on a much larger scale. Everywhere we turn, we see the signs of the end in extreme wickedness, violence, and immorality. Senseless brutality shocks us and makes us long for our heavenly home. Oh, how we ache for the souls that are lost and in need of salvation. Genesis 6 tells us that the world before the flood was filled with violence. It was not something that was an occasional occurrence. It was everywhere and everyday life. Life that God had created was not at all respected. Men delighted in violence and committed it with impunity. They had lost their respect for God, and when that happens, men lose respect for their fellow human beings and other creatures. They were deluged with violence, so God sent them a violent deluge to end it all. Listen to this statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 99. Polygamy had been early introduced, contrary to the divine arrangement at the beginning. The Lord gave to Adam one wife, showing his order in that respect. But after the fall, men chose to follow their own sinful desires, and as a result, crime and wretchedness rapidly increased. Neither the marriage relation nor the rights of property were respected. Whoever coveted the wives or possessions of his neighbor took them by force, and men exalted in their deeds of violence. They delighted in destroying the life of animals, and the use of flesh for food rendered them still more cruel and bloodthirsty, until they came to regard human life with astonishing indifference. Here's another statement from the same book, page 157. In Sodom there was mirth and revelry, feasting and drunkenness. The vilest and most brutal passions were unrestrained. The people openly defied God and His law and delighted in deeds of violence. Though they had before them the example of the antediluvian world and knew how the wrath of God had been manifested in their destruction, yet they followed the same course of wickedness. Today, violence is again everywhere. The cities are full of it. The nations are full of it as they continue to talk of war. There are terrorist explosions every day or two in some places. There are bombs that go off. There are violent demonstrations and riots in the streets of Greece, Portugal, Spain, and as we saw in London and other cities in England not long ago. There is genocide, assassinations, rape, extrajudicial killings, road rage, air rage, drug violence, gang violence, and hate crimes. 10,000 people have been killed in Mexico in the last few years over drug wars. There are beatings, beheadings, stabbings, violent flash mobs, robbery, murder, bloodshed. The list goes on and on. As Hollywood venerates violence through film, children play with toys that glorify shooting and killing. Youth play violent internet games and compete with each other in cyberspace. Families are breaking up with fighting, and domestic abuse is common. The newspapers are full of the story of corruption, evil, hostility, and aggression. There are socially acceptable forms of violence, too, like the various forms of competitive sports. Yes, many sports are a form of violence, but it is more than that. Competitive sport is violent in principle, because the object of the game is to win by taking advantage of the weaknesses of the opponent. Another form of socially acceptable violence in many countries is abortion. Mostly, people are not willing to curb their sexual desire and end up aborting the unwanted pregnancy. Abortion solves the so-called problem. What an account will have to be rendered in the final reckoning. Human nature is plagued with the proclivity to solve its problems with violence. What happened in Colorado was merely a gross development of the evil embedded in every human heart and in human nature from the very beginning of sin. People who fill their minds with violence will carry it out in one form or another. People resort to violence when they believe they have no other option. Why is human nature that way? Where did violence come from? To understand it, to find out and discover the cause, we have to go to the Bible. In Ezekiel 28, verses 14 to 17, we read what really happened in heaven. Speaking of Lucifer, the covering cherub, God said, 
Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. It is pride, a heart lifted up, that causes sin. Pride causes the, a created being to turn from loyalty to his creator. And the consequence of sin is violence. The reason is this. Sin and righteousness cannot coexist. Truth and error cannot abide together. They are two different cultures and they clash. So it is sin that causes violence. And violence is the natural result of turning away from God and going in your own way. You will inevitably become violent if you turn from God. It is the self-protection mechanism. Originally, there was a violent war in heaven, says Revelation 12:7. Even Christ, whose name is Michael, had to get involved. Satan and Michael fought, and the angels of each fought the violent war, which ended with Lucifer and the rebellious angels being cast out of heaven. The physical violence in heaven was but a natural and literal development of the violence that Lucifer did in the minds of one-third of the angels of God by alienating them from Christ their Creator. Violence usually starts subtly and in the mind. Lucifer started by insinuating negative things about God. He raised questions in the minds of the unfallen angels about God's justice, mercy, and love. He kept at it until it matured. He thought he had a coalition of angels that could join with him to overthrow the heavenly government of God. He was planning a coup d'etat. God had to intervene and limit Satan's power and access. But he gave all the angels a choice. They could choose to be loyal or they could choose to disobey. Sometimes violence is very subtle and unnoticeable at first. Often it is through insinuation or by suggestion, or implication that evil thoughts are implanted in the mind, similar to what Lucifer did in heaven and in the Garden of Eden. One person is alienated from another by gossip, evil surmising, and intimation. This is a form of violence that is often used when someone has a hidden agenda. In some Christian circles, this kind of thing is piously excused as if it is necessary in the service of God. Others have an anger management problem, and it flares up in violent language or acts. The root of an anger management problem is pride. When their authority is challenged, they get angry very quickly and lash out at those perceived to question their authority. Their lack of self-management causes them to feel like they have to establish their power and authority. But it always backfires. People may fear them, but they don't love them. Anger is a form of violence, and it manifests itself in many ways, such as taking God's name in vain by cursing and swearing, hostile behavior, cutting off communication, and abusive language and behavior. Anger is also demanding and self-centered. It argues to the death and leaves no room for other opinions. The classic example of unresolved anger is often publicly displayed in supermarkets when children act up and mother loses her temper as her authority is challenged. She then mercilessly yells and beats her child into submission. Of course, there are many other ways in which anger manifests itself that are too numerous to list. They are not hard to pick out. You can see them all around you. Genesis teaches us something about why we were created. In the Garden of Eden, everything was at peace. There was no violence, not even among the animals and birds. All was in harmony. There was utter security and utter peace. The Garden was a beautiful home for Adam and Eve. Man was made in the image of God. God created them with 
capacities that were fantastic and that would reveal God's glory. Listen to this tremendous idea from the devotional book Sons and Daughters of God, page 7. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God, and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. They were to live in close communion with heaven, receiving power from the source of all power. Upheld by God, they were to live sinless lives. So God's purpose in creating man was to establish a distinct race of beings that were created in the image of God both in body and in intellectual characteristics. They would be pure and holy. They would commune in a way that no other being could with their Creator. They had intimate fellowship. Incidentally, the Genesis record tells us that in creating man, it was a deliberate act. It was not something that happened by some cosmic accident. It is important to understand this because this is what gives us humans identity in the grand scheme of the universe. It gives us a purpose and a destiny. And nothing would disturb the peace unless man accepted the falsehoods of Satan and disobeyed God. And that would bring chaos. Once the deceiver's lies were accepted and acted upon, Adam and Eve started on the downward path that leads to self-destruction and death. God originally intended man to rule over all of creation in partnership with himself. Let us look at what God said in Genesis 1.26. And God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. But delegating rulership to Adam and Eve implied that they would be loyal to God, who had entrusted them to look after his creation. By placing a test in the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God intended to establish the loyalty of his very special human creation. He wanted them to understand loyalty by experience, not just by telling them. Failing the test meant that Adam and Eve were no longer trustworthy because they were not loyal. At the point when Adam and Eve sinned, their circumstances changed, and God had to implement the plan of salvation to save man from destruction and to restore him to a position of honor and rulership. That's what the sorrow and the sweat of thy brow and the multiplied conception in childbirth is all about. The problem with disobedience is that it represents a decision to go on without God. It tells God that you don't need Him or don't want Him to guide your life. This is what Adam and Eve were saying when they ate of the tree. They were going to go their own way. They wanted to acquire knowledge of their own instead of depending on the all-knowing God for knowledge. They were the prototypes of evolutionary scientists and others today who choose to pursue knowledge without God. Disobedience in the Garden of Eden required immediate and decisive action to prevent the perpetuation of evil. If they had eaten of the tree of life after eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this would have created a serious problem for the whole universe. Sin would have become eternal. So they were immediately barred from the tree of life, not because God was being cruel to them, but because the issues in the great controversy between Christ and Satan required that sin, though permitted for a time, would eventually be destroyed when all have made the choice. The universe would again be secure. Their decision to leave God and go their own way meant that Adam and Eve set in motion a series of developments in human nature that would cause great sorrow, stress and fear, and especially violence. It is a cause and effect consequence to our choices. Adam's first response in Genesis 3 verse 10 was fear. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid, Adam said when God called for him. Why was Adam afraid? He knew he had done something wrong and was afraid that God would do something violent. He distrusted God. Distrust of God also motivated the Babelites as they built their tower. Down through the dark centuries, even to our own time, false religion has been successful because it has preyed on human fear of violence. The mythical gods of the polytheistic religions portrayed the gods as violent against each other and against human subjects. 
Even the Jews taught that God was violent by causing some who sinned to have severe handicaps, crises, or disasters. Those with handicapped children were said to be under the judgment of God. Roman Catholicism Christianized pagan gods and made them saints, but they pictured God as violent by burning people in hell for eternity, for instance. They claimed to be the representatives of God on earth, but tortured heretics in dungeons or burned them at the stake. Imagine what that said about God. It certainly wasn't one of a loving God, but a rather violent one. Penance, pilgrimage, indulgences, paying money to the church, and many other forms of atonement were necessary to purify sin from the soul. Catholic doctrine obscures the true principles of Christ's atonement and his love. Though God rarely meets out violent judgments, he is not moved by human passions or sinful principles when he does. He always has the long-term security of the universe in mind and the salvation of souls. Adam revealed the key principle underlying sinful human nature. Self-centeredness always leads to competing self-interest with others. When something goes wrong, we naturally blame others like Adam blamed Eve and make accusations, which is another form of violence. Why do trade unions sometimes get violent? Well, it's because there is competing interest between labor and capital. Why do politics become unsavory and each party accuses the other? Well, there are competing interests at stake. Each party tries to discredit the other to gain votes. Why do church members become upset with one another? They have competing self-centered interests. When man sinned, the world changed. Adam and Eve were now in a different relationship to God and to creation. Now even the animals and birds feared them. No longer was there peace and tranquility. The war in heaven had now become war on earth. Now there was no peace in this world. Even people living in the most peaceful places have worries and fears. Even in small towns now there is violence. Places that were once a haven of shelter from the evil of the world have now been invaded by satellite TV, internet, and other things. Violence has become a permanent feature of human society. It is one of the long-lasting results of disobedience. It wasn't long after Adam and Eve had their first two children that the first murder occurred. Abel had obeyed God and his sacrifice was accepted. But Cain chose his own worship style and was not accepted. He became so angry with his brother Abel that he killed him. Here's how the Apostle John describes it. We should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. That's 1 John 3.12. Note that Cain was of that wicked one. That's Satan. Cain's parents were the same ones as Abel's, but when Cain decided to go his own way and leave God's plan, he came under the power of Satan, that wicked one, and it led to the murder of his brother. You see, my friends, love is the only way to have peace. Love is the only way to stem the violence. If you learn to have love in your heart, the hostility and aggression will disappear. Note also that Cain's works were evil. The wicked have always been jealous of the righteous. Why is there so much envy against the righteous? It's because they set an example that the wicked do not want to follow. In fact, they hate righteousness and do not want the restraining moral influence of those who obey God. Cain wanted God to accept him just as he was. He wanted God to overlook his disobedience. If Cain was a modern preacher, he would probably be telling his congregation that their sins have all been forgiven past, present, and future, and they don't have to worry. They are saved no matter what they do or do not do. He would tell them that God doesn't worry about their obedience. After all, we'll be sinning till Jesus comes. God loves us too much to let a little thing like the Ten Commandments get in the way of salvation. He would tell his church members that they don't need to really be careful about Sabbath keeping. The seventh day is not all that important, he would say. You can keep one day in seven. That's the principle. He would probably try to bring in new worship styles like he did back then so the people can have a good sensory experience at church. He might even suggest that reading the mystics and using the spiritual exercises of Loyola would be worthwhile. 
Oh, and, and if there would be those who would object to his teachings, he would preach against legalism and say that those who advocate obedience are trying to earn their way to heaven. And one day soon, many of the pastors who teach these things will become so angry at those who insist on following all of God's Ten Commandments that they will do things that are presently unthinkable. Do you think that what Cain did to righteous Abel will be done to some faithful souls near the close of probation? Cain had developed a sense of inferiority, which made him envy his brother Abel. God saw that Cain was angry. So the Lord asked Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou do doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Genesis 4, 6-7 God was pointing out that Cain's anger at Abel had no basis. He should have been angry with himself for not doing what God had said to do. He was not doing well. He was not obeying God. And therefore God could not bless him. His anger was misdirected. God even pointed out that sin lieth at the door. He knew what Cain was thinking of doing. He knew that anger and resentment would cause violence. And today it still does. The Apostle Jude in verse 11 declares that those who speak evil of the things they know not go in the way of Cain. The way of Cain is to disobey God. The way of Cain is the way of sin. It is also the way of violence. Cain thought he should have the favor of God like Abel, but he didn't want to comply with the conditions. Finally, he yielded to the temptation to kill Abel to get rid of the moral barrier of his rival. And by the way, violence can take many forms. Bullying can be a form of violence. Biting criticism is a form of violence. The assassination of someone's reputation is a form of violence. One-sided judgment, meanness, mistreatment, and even misrepresenting someone are forms of violence. Anything that is not of the fruits of the Spirit is a form of violence or leads to violence. God said to Cain, And now art thou cursed from the earth. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Genesis 4, 11 and 12. Cain had brought the fruit of the ground for sacrifice, but now God said the ground would not yield its strength. It would not produce as much fruit as before. He had wandered away from God, so God said that Cain would be a wandering fugitive and a vagabond. The violence in his heart had led to real violence in the field. Cain could no longer be trusted to treat others with respect, so he had to be separated from God's people. In the end, people who are violent have to be separated from society to restore order and security. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and built a, the first city recorded in Scripture. It was called Enoch after his firstborn son. Building a city was Cain's way of compensating for the curse on the ground. He also needed companionship, so he built the city that would accommodate all those who were like mind and of like character. Kindred spirits in wickedness, if you will, partners in crime. City life, which symbolizes separation from God's presence in Eden, is a life that is surrounded by evil, wickedness, and violence. Cain was not only the founder of city life, but he was also the founder of murder as a means of settling disputes. After this, violence only increased in the land. Cain's descendant Lamech also bragged that he had murdered a young man. Genesis 4.23 Incidentally, Lamech was also the world's first polygamist. He married two wives. Cain's descendants were determined in their rebellion, and they did not care about God's law. By the time of the flood, God said violence filled the earth, Genesis 6.11. Depraved evil, immorality, and violence had become the norm of society, and it came to a climax at the time of Noah. Rebellion and sin were everywhere. The intellect of those people was so great that they could develop all manner of technology to advance their wickedness, including genetic engineering and amalgamations. The thoughts and imaginations of their hearts were only evil continually. Genesis 6, verse 5. God told Noah in Genesis 6, 13, that the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, 
and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God had to arrest the progress of sin, or man would destroy himself, and there would be no representatives of God's truth in the land. That's the way Satan wants it. He wants to remove every vestige of the law of God and any witness to its authority and power. He is determined to do everything he can to force compliance with his laws and disobedience to God's laws, if he can. But those who fear the Lord recognize the great promise of 2 Samuel 22, verse 3, The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. You see, wickedness and violence go together. Listen to these words. Psalm 11.5 says, The Lord tried the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Proverbs 10.11 The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Proverbs 13, verse 2, A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. Speaking of Christ, Isaiah, in chapter 53, verse 9, says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. In other words, Christ was sinless, and therefore he could save even the wicked and violent if they will repent. Note also that deceit is a form of violence. As we near the close of human probation, we again see violence as a key sign of the times. Christ told us that this will happen. He said that the enemies of God's people will kill his faithful servants, all the while thinking that they are doing God a good service. That's from John 16, verse 2. In fact, the prophet Ezekiel referred to God's church when he said, Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. In other words, the church persecutes its own members. That's Ezekiel 7, verse 11. And when a church turns its back on God, it does violence to those who oppose it. A classic example of this was the established church in the Dark Ages. The rack, the thumbscrew, and the stake were the lot of those who disobeyed the instructions of the mother church. Human nature is no different than it was back then. It is probably even worse. So do you think that there is coming a time when the same violent practices that were seen in the Dark Ages will be repeated again? Listen to this prophetic statement. Rome is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. That's Great Controversy, page 581. So you see, there is a time coming when God's true people will again be in a situation where they will face violence for righteousness' sake. As violence becomes more and more common and as wickedness increases, the respect for human life will be swept away and torture, abuse, and death will be the lot of those who live pure lives for Jesus. The dark night is rising. Satan, the arch enemy of Christ, is seeking to keep you from eternal life. The great controversy is reaching the end stages. Soon we will see the end of all the evil, violence, aggression, and bloodshed that this world knows so well. God calls us to be examples of peace and tranquility in the midst of a world of violence. No matter what chaos happens around us, we can have His peace in our hearts. That perfect love and peace casts out all fear and violence. Oh, my friends, let us remember that we are pilgrims and strangers in this spiritually barren and polluted land. We need to be free from the evil in our own hearts so that we will not yield to Satan's power and temptations. Many have gone before us. The Apostle Paul tells us of those whom God sustained through many forms of violence. Hebrews 11, verse 32 to 40 says, And what shall I more say? 
For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, And those all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. You see, my friends, the story of Cain and Abel is a story that has prophetic application all the way down to our own time. There is just as much enmity toward those who love God and His Word as there was in Cain's heart toward Abel. It will be a deadly hatred when the restraining hand of God is withdrawn from the wicked. But in the end, all the violent powers of the earth, which have set the example for the common man, and who have reined them up to violence against the righteous, will be violently thrown down. Listen to what Revelation 18 verse 21 says. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. Friends, I want to be among the number who are with the Lamb of God, King Jesus, who is victor in the battle with Satan. Jesus says that in the new earth the creation will be at peace. All violence will end. Listen to this from Isaiah eleven six through 9 The wolf also shall dwell with the Lamb, And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Ironically, violence is one way that God gets us ready for the sheer tranquil peace of heaven. It makes us long for it, hunger for it, and live for it. Violence causes us to turn our backs on this earth and let go of its transient joys and put our hand in the hand of God, placing our confident hope in the earth made new. I want to be in that great land of peace, don't you? And the only way that I can be there is if I have Jesus' peace in my heart today. Then whatever happens in this world will be ordained of God for the good of His cause and for my eternal good. I hope you want that too, my friends. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we long for the peace and tranquility of heaven. We long for this long, dark night of sin to pass away and for Jesus to come and take us home. We know that there is a lot to go through before he comes again in the clouds of heaven. The darkest part of the night is indeed rising. Violence has penetrated almost everywhere. It is even inside of us. But we pray that you will keep us close to your side, purge us of all violence, We must take time to study your word daily. We must take time to learn of Jesus so that his peace will replace the fear and violence in our own hearts. We would do the same thing that James Holmes did in Colorado if it wasn't for the restraining spirit of God that has kept us from that kind of senseless violence. But sometimes we see ugly things inside our own hearts that we know Jesus doesn't want us to have. I pray that he will take them and change us into his image so that we only behold the love of God for us and for those around us. May we be ready to receive the latter rain is my prayer. In Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. I need thee every hour, most gracious.
We hope you've been greatly blessed by this month's message. Your prayers and gifts mean much to us. Thank you for your support. The music you have just heard is called I Need Thee Every Hour, sung by Christian Berdahl. It is recorded on a CD with other beautiful hymns called Consecration. This beautiful CD is available from Keep the Faith Ministry. If you would like to have a copy of this CD or copies for your friends or family, just send $16 each postpaid to U.S. addresses to cover the cost, and we will gladly send them. Please mention the Consecration CD. Our international listeners should send $20 USD. The following is our monthly prophetic intelligence briefing, a feature that brings you current events in light of Bible prophecy, especially for those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ. We can see the signs of the times, telling us that we are nearing the world's great crisis. May the Lord find us faithful. Our first item this month, Cardinal Dolan to pray at GOP convention. The National Catholic Reporters said that the planned prayer by Cardinal Archbishop Timothy Dolan of New York at the Republican National Convention in Tampa is a political endorsement of Mormon Mitt Romney and Roman Catholic running mate 
Paul Ryan, in spite of Dolan's claim that he is just a priest at prayer. The notion that Catholic bishops in the United States have not been involved in politics historically or should not be involved in politics is, in the first instance, a fiction, wrote the reporter. The Catholic Church aspires to be a robust presence in the culture, to influence systemic change, to argue and persuade toward what it considers the most loving and just options for human society. In short, it's a player, always has been, and presumably always will be. While Dolan, dubbed the Pope of America, is not the first Catholic to pray at the Republican or Democratic national conventions. The Church has interests to protect. The Church, for instance, can rightly claim to be the major deliverer of social services in the United States, only because it does so with millions and millions of dollars of federal aid, certainly a fact which Representative Paul Ryan is aware. Again, that's quoted from the National uh, Catholic Reporter. Connecting at the political national conventions is certainly going to help keep that going. But Catholic political involvement in U.S. politics has been going on for a long time. Cardinal Francis Spellman, a predecessor of Dolan in New York, had ready access to the White House of Dwight D. Eisenhower. Cardinal John Kroll of Philadelphia knew how to smoothly signal his support for a favored politician. In this instance... Instead of deferring to the local bishop, Robert Lynch, which would not be perceived as a political endorsement, Dolan is taking the big political stage himself. But religion in American politics has become a major supporting role. Dolan, a student of history, has to understand that the polarization in both church and civic culture has reached levels that approach unique with the unprecedented intertwining of religion in our politics. So it is no longer of just momentary notice that the Catholic Cardinal Archbishop of New York makes an appearance at the Republican Convention. The rest of the world knows he is being used. That's simply part of playing the political spotlight, and to pretend otherwise is naive. There's more than a prayer at stake. That's another quote from the National Catholic Reporter. Dolan and Bishop Robert Morlino have both lavished praise on GOP candidate, or rather vice presidential candidate, Paul Ryan. They're all friends. And the praise is tantamount to an endorsement of the Republican candidate. It would be difficult for anyone to construe Dolan's appearance as anything but an an endorsement. William Donahue of the Catholic League said, The Republicans are smart enough to get the Pope of America and the Democrats are stupid enough not to invite him. Dolan is playing an old game, but an increasingly dangerous one as well. Dolan is dragging the church and its invaluable swing voters into the midst of the fray, simultaneously allowing religion to be used as a tool of division. His protests that his appearance is nonpartisan and that he is merely a priest at prayer have already been swamped by the partisan cheering. That claim is gratuitous. Dolan is a student of history. He would know that that the papacy works by stealth and silence, and then more openly, as the mystery of iniquity gains control of the hearts and minds of men. See Great Controversy, page 49. He knows how to play that old game. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it's too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. The Great Controversy, page 581. Next. California to ban curing gay children. The California legislature has passed a law that would restrict parents from trying to cure their minor children's same-sex attractions. If both state houses can agree on the final language, the legislation, which would ban all sexual orientation change effort, 
and treatment for minors will be sent to Democratic Governor Jerry Brown for his signature sometime in September. The law unconstitutionally prohibits speech, violates privacy, and personal autonomy rights, intermeddles in theological disputes, clashes with other laws, and creates significant unintended consequences, said Mac McReynolds, a staff attorney with Sacramento-based Pacific Justice Institute. The bill threatens to shame patients and silence counselors, therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists, McReynolds told Fox News. The bill was sponsored by a coalition of gay rights groups who claim that the bill would help prevent the harmful impact of reparative therapy. Opponents of the bill believe that it is a violation of parental rights and that it would have a chilling effect on the ability of therapists to treat their patients. The bill bans SOCE treatments for minors, regardless of their parents' desires. SOCE stands for Sex Orientation Change Effort. This is really a serious violation of the constitutional rights of patients and counselors, a violation of privacy, and an outright attack on the rights of parents to decide what is best for their children, said Brad Dacus, president of Pacific Justice Institute. Public opposition to the bill has been loud and long, but now it appears to have passed both houses in the California legislature. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Luke 17, 28, and 30. Next, Monty calls for EU governments to take power from their parliaments. Mario Monti, Italian Prime Minister, says that signs of a psychological meltdown in Europe risk destroying the European project unless governments act quickly, even at the expense of parliamentary democracy. He believes that governments should preserve their powers, even at the expense of the powers of their parliaments, when negotiating solutions to the economic crisis. If governments were bound completely by the decisions of their parliaments, he said, Without preserving any negotiating space, Europe's collapse would be more likely than a deeper integration. Monty is concerned about the German parliament, the Bundestag, which is hampering Angela Merkel's crisis response. All money-related decisions have to be approved by the German parliament. As opposition to more financial support to other struggling nations grows, the German parliament is working against Angela Merkel the Chancellor, to prevent more German money spent to bolster weak nations. But Monty is, in essence, calling for, a, for greater powers for the German Chancellor. Needless to say, his remarks created a negative reaction from the German Parliament. Europe is headed for another dictator as frustration over the economic crisis continues to mount. Monty's comments make it clear that he, in addition to other European leaders, view more centralized control as the only way to solve the crisis. Europe is gradually restoring the Holy Roman Empire under the control of the Vatican. Mario Monti is a Roman Catholic, as are most all other European leaders who are working to put the Vatican back on the throne of Europe. Next, gay marriage pushed in Tasmania and New Zealand. Tasmania, Australia, and New Zealand are joining the movement that calls for equal rights for gay and lesbian couples who wish to marry. Tasmania is now an upper house vote away from becoming the country's first gay wedding destination after the same-sex marriage bill in 2012 sailed through the Legislative Assembly. The bill passed despite some opposition. Quotes from the Bible were used in the debate as party members from both Labour and Greens spoke in support of the bill. Liberal leader Will Hodgman was the lone voice against the bill, saying his team was united in believing marriage was between a man and a woman and a matter for the Commonwealth. Gay and lesbians viewed opposition to the bill as based on discrimination. Miss Giddings, a co-sponsor of the bill, said, I do not believe that the personal moral disapproval that some individuals may feel toward same-sex marriage is a valid reason to allow discrimination to continue in the 21st century. Though Tasmania was the last Australian state to decriminalize homosexuality in 1997, 
it was the first to recognize civil unions in 2003. Gay rights groups promote legalizing gay marriage by saying that such laws will help build stronger relationships and families, foster a more inclusive society, benefit the economy, and increase pressure on other states and the federal government to follow. These remarks are political and most likely not based on solid research. Note that they intend to use the legislation to pressure other Australian states and the federal government to do the same. Also, the New Zealand Parliament has overwhelmingly passed the first stage of a gay marriage law. It is expected to easily pass two additional votes, making New Zealand the twelfth country since 2001 to legalize gay marriage. However, opposition is not weak. Before the bill's reading, lobby groups gathered the signatures of 50,000 people opposed to it. Bob McCroskey, head of Family First, told the New Zealand Herald, in most of history, as well as most societies, marriage is defined as between a man and a woman. He also said that if marriage was redefined, there was nothing to stop it being redefined again to allow polygamy, polyamory, and incest. In a legal opinion by lawyer Ian Bassett, Mr. Bassett basically said that those in opposition to the bill may likely be forced to perform and provide services for gay marriages. He said to refuse would be breaching the Human Rights Act. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. Next, Mega Church High. A University of Washington study suggests that worship services at mega churches can trigger feelings of transcendence and changes in brain chemistry that create a spiritual high that keeps members coming back for more. The brain chemical is oxytocin, which creates euphoria and joy and acts like a drug. The study, God is Like a Drug, Explaining Interaction Ritual Chains in American Megachurches, suggests that large gatherings of shared experience like concerts and sporting events triggers feelings of euphoria. Researchers call it an oxytocin cocktail of shared transcendent experience. In the presence of large and emotional social gathering, the brain releases oxytocin, creating transcendent feelings which are perceived as coming from God or the divine. One congregant reported, God's love becomes such a drug that you can't wait to come get your next hit. You can't wait to get involved to get the high from God. Another said, You can look up into the balcony and see the Holy Spirit go over the crowd like a wave in a football game. The style of worship is what creates the high. Use of technology and appeals to emotion create the shared experience leading to the mass euphoria. Mega churches use upbeat modern music, cameras, and screens to project people smiling, crying, dancing, etc. on large screens, and an emotional charismatic preacher to create the environment for a strong emotional experience. The pastor functions as an energy star who engages the congregation through an accessible, uh, informal, and emotional sermon. Rather than being analytical and theological, the message just feels right or just makes sense for congregants. To extend the spiritual high beyond Sunday, the churches feature small group activities, such as Bible study, book clubs, and volunteer activities, the researchers said. But it is Sunday worship that brings people back. Being addicted to church is not new, but now the mechanism for the addiction is better understood. Satan knows the human systems very well. He knows that by creating mass hysteria or hypnosis, we can control large crowds and keep them addicted to a superficial message. Will megachurches become a tool to oppose God's last warning message and through manipulation and emotional addiction prevent the masses from accepting the deeper truths for the last days? The things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me, would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, and ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. 
better never to have the worship of God blended with music than to use musical instruments to do the work which last January was represented to me would be brought into our camp meetings. The truth for this time needs nothing of this kind in its work of converting souls. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and the noise to have a carnival, and this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. Next, ECB leader proposes complete subjugation of the European economy. On July 17, 2012, Jörg Asmussen, a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank, or the ECB, gave a speech at the European Policy Center in Brussels. He made it clear that the ECB is able and willing to supervise all the banks of the Eurozone. This means that the ECB would work through the respective central banks of each country to regulate and control the various types of banks, budgets, and fiscal policy, and thereby control the economy. More importantly, this would require further sharing of sovereignty, as Musin said, which would mean that the various nations would yield power and control to the central government in Brussels and to the ECB. Asmussen explained what this is meant by sharing sovereignty. It means endowing the euro area with the power to effectively prevent and correct unsustainable policies in every euro area member state, he said. Concretely, this would imply that a euro area authority would have competence to limit countries' ability to issue debt and have intervention rights into national budgets, and to compel member states to correct their policies, be that in the fiscal, structural, or financial fields. In other words, Asmussen is proposing that the new Eurozone Authority would take complete control of the economy, fiscal policy, budgets, and consequently the social and political structure of each country. That's the banks that would do that. The dramatic proposal is breathtaking, but it is what the Euro leaders have wanted for a long, long time, control of every transaction and therefore control of the lives of every citizen. It's obvious that the European Union is determined to keep the Eurozone together. It is equally obvious that their only solution is to demand more integration of political and economic interests. These reports and speeches come at a time when investors, markets, and even some local politicians are predicting, and in some cases preparing, for the breakup of the Eurozone. But this is not what the leaders are planning. Their solution is not the breakup, but the complete subjugation of the nations in the grip of the Eurozone. According to the Bible, there will eventually be a global religion imposed on the nations and their citizens, as well as a fiscal, banking, and political order. A global religion requires a global economy and a global political order. These are currently being put in place in Europe, which is central to the interests of the Vatican. Unfortunately, our time has run out. Be sure to go to our website and read more of our prophetic intelligence briefings. It's been a great pleasure to spend this time with you. I hope you have been encouraged to live for Jesus, for we are near the end. Remember that God has a plan for your life. And that right now you can make a new start with Jesus. Thank you for your prayers and support. And until next time, may God bless and keep you and your family in his loving and protecting care. Keep the faith.